Okay, we're going to dive right back into the very first chapter of the Bible. Genesis chapter 1, we've been uh, looking in this series about asking the, those big questions of life, beginning with whether or not Genesis is even the Word of God. Can we call it the Word of God? And then we looked at the question, uh, who is God? And then last week we considered the question, how did all of this happen? Where did it all begin? Where did it all come from? And, um, and then this week we're going to be looking at the, the question before us that is presented in verses 26 through 31. And uh, that has to do with the question about um, mankind. And uh, these are all fundamental questions that every culture and every person, whether they con consciously think about this or not, everybody asks these questions and everybody has an answer for it because that's how they understand reality. That's how they understand the world. And so let me begin by looking at verses 20, 26 through 31, which says, Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. They will rule the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky and the livestock, the whole earth and the creatures that crawl on the earth. So God created man in his own image. He created him in the image of God. He created them male and female. God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, and every creature that crawls on the earth. God also said, Look, I have given you every seed-bearing plant on the surface of the entire earth and every tree whose fruit contains seed. This will be food for you, for all the wildlife of the earth, for every bird of the sky, and for every creature that crawls on the earth. Everything having the breath of life in it, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw all that he had made, and it was very good indeed. Evening came, and then morning, the sixth day. So, what is a human being? Now, that's, that is a... Um, a question that has become more complicated these days. And uh, if you consult, for example, the Encyclopedia Britannica, it will explain that a, a human being is an advanced primate. And that between, you know, seven, eight million years ago, we descended from the great apes. This, the brilliant physicist Stephen Hawking uh, he suffered from a uh, motor neuron disease, and he had a specially designed computer that would help him to speak and to write. And um, he envisioned his brain like a computer. He says, as long as my computer is functioning, I will continue to work. But when my computer stops working, and when my components fail... Of course, then I die. So he thought of himself like a machine. And so he made a statement toward the end of his life, there is no heaven or afterlife for broken down computers. And this is a fairy tale for people afraid of the dark. So what is a human being? Are we just advanced, complex machines? Are we... Descended from primates? Exactly who are you? Or are we perhaps what Carl Sagan, the, uh, the, the, the astronomer, famously said that we are stuff from stars and that the cosmos is within us and that we are essentially just a collection of billions and he, he loved billions, didn't he? Remember him? And he hit that B really hard billions and billions of atoms, and we are dust from stars, and that is who we are. So how do you answer that question? What is a human being? Now, this is important because it is a question and an answer 
that fits into your structure of your worldview. And when I talk about worldview, it's a fancy word for just how you see the world around you. For example, if you were to stand in Times Square and you were to ask everybody, you know, coming along, get your microphone, your tape recorder, and you said, who is God? You might get a whole notebook full of different answers. Because you, you have all of these ideas, and every idea has consequences. So that whatever their notion, whatever their belief is, about who is God, or in this quick case, what is a human being, it's going, to, it's going to have consequences across the whole of their life. Now, you may have an answer, you know, to who is God, and you think, well, everybody must think like that. I'm afraid they don't. And there are some ideas out there that are so diametrically opposite of yours that you're thinking, how could you think that way? Because that's not how I was raised. Yeah, but yeah, but that's not how everybody thinks. And so these are components and part of the, um, the worldview that you have. And we're looking at this question today. What is a human being? And fundamentally, the differences that drive the arguments that we see in society today, many of them go back to the worldview that that person has. So you see an interview on television, in the news, or you see a talk show, or you read an article in the internet, and you, can, you, and you see that those views are contrary to yours? Well, trace it back to the worldview that they hold. And you see that played out all the time. And there are some arguments that get very loud and heated. You know, vitriolic, we call it. And they, and they get very animated in how they believe so strongly in a particular issue. This, a couple of weeks ago, the Wall Street Journal had in its opinion piece uh, an article entitled, Do We Know What a Woman Is? And the blurb under it said, in our age of great complexity, one had better study up. Now, you think that that's an easy question? Well, for some people, it really get, has gotten in a quandary. And they're asking that question. The debate about aborting a, a baby is a worldview issue. So is the other one about what is a woman. That's a worldview issue. That goes back to this question. They're all related to this question, what is a human being? And so when it comes to abortion, for instance, the American College of OBGYNs published last March a guide to language and abortion. And in the guide, they urge those uh, physicians not to use certain language, don't use the word baby or unborn child, but at all times use only the word fetus because they maintain that the language baby is inherently biased and inaccurate. And don't use words such as fetal heartbeat or the word womb. These are all fundamentally the question about what is a human being? It's a worldview guidebook that's supposed to shape how we talk. The language of gender and the pronouns that people use is a very hot button uh, issue today on university campuses and workplaces and publishing in the media and in the first day of 2021, new rules were outlined for gender-neutral language in the U.S. Congress. It comes back to this worldview. And those who do not wish to be identified as male or female use non-binary language. And then there are some who prefer to be gender-fluid and flexible in all of this. All of these are related to this question, what is a human being? It's worldview. And that's why 
when we consult the Word of God, and I will call it the Word of God. When I consult the Word of God, I ask the question, does it shed any light on this? Can it help us to think a certain proper way about these matters? When King David looked into the heavens, unlike Carl Sagan, he saw the handiwork of God. And he wrote in Psalm 8, When I observe your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and stars that you set in place, what is a human being that you remember him, a son of man that you look after him? You made him a little less than God, and crowned him with glory and honor, and you made him ruler over the works of your hands. Right there in those two verses are like four big questions and answers to those big questions. Fundamental. Like, for example, where did the universe come from? Well, he says, the work of your fingers. There's the answer. Or the next question, oh, where did I come from? And he answers it. You made him. You made us. And he says that twice. And then the next question is, well, who am I? Where do I fit into all this? He answers it. He says, you made him a little less than God, crowned with glory and honor. And then the, the big question that people ask is, well, does my life have any purpose at all? He answers it. He says that you are a co-regents with God over the works of his hands. You made him a ruler along with God. The purpose. It, it's four of them. Basic questions right there in Psalm 8. It's wonderful. Now, David understood that we are much closer to God than any of the other creatures, a little less than God. It's the same word as Genesis 1.1. Uh, Elohim is the word that's used there, the name for God. That's why the translators chose that rather than angels. And then secondly, he goes on to say that we've been crowned with glory and honor, which means that humans are the chief among all of the creatures in the highest place of dig dignity. And that it's as though God has put on our head a regal crown to demonstrate just how important we are to him. The Encyclopedia Britannica missed all of that. But David didn't. So we are not advanced apes after all. What we are are masterpieces created by God, royalty, royalty in his, in his mind. So now, if this is your view of reality, this is how you understand the world around you, then you can see how it determines the value that you place upon an unborn child or the value you place upon somebody born with a disability. Or, or the value you place upon the elderly, upon anybody, any human being. And, and it, it touches on the honor that we show to human beings, no matter what their ethnic background, their heritage, their color. The Word of God touches on so many issues today that have been politicized. But they, they, we need to take them out of the hands of the politicians and put them back into the Bible students and to put them back into the, the hands of, of those who love God's Word. And, and the reason why Christians, first and foremost, should be interested in nature and creation and what we call climate is because God has given us the, the, the privilege of being co-regents with Him. We rule. We read it. He said it twice in just that portion that we were looking at. And it's important for us to understand that the issue of climate, for instance, is not a political issue fundamentally. It's about Christians understanding themselves as being co-rulers with God over what he's created. So we're stewards in this. 
The, the issue of the unborn rights is not a political issue. God has something to say about this. The issue of social justice needs to be removed from the hands of politicians and put back in the hands of Bible students. Because what he says here is that we look out for one another because we are all crowned with glory and honor. Everybody. Everybody. All human beings are. So you see how Genesis is so foundational to how we think? It touches on everything. Like humans, what's a human? Sexuality, gender, equality and fairness, the natural world around us, marriage, suffering, the meaning of life, it's all right there. So you know, when we get in a conversation with somebody at the coffee table, and some of these issues come up, and they look at us and say, well, what do you think about that? The place to start is, well, what does the Word of God say about this? Does the Word of God have anything to contribute here? Does the Word of God help us to think properly about this? That's where I want to start. And not just reach out and just start somewhere else. And so what does the Word of God have to say when we go back to Genesis about this question of what is a human being? We go back to verse 26. Go back to your Bible. Back to the Bible. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. So you see right there that we are not a cosmic collection of stardust. We are not the result of some random collision of circumstances over billions and billions of years, but humans are the direct creation of the living and true God. And so what is saying, according to the Bible, you are someone, not something. And because we are someone and something, there is, a, there is a, 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 um, an undergirding of that. And the reason why is because we are created by the living and true God. Reason number one, why you are someone and not something. Before God created the first human, the Bible says that he kind of hit the pause button. And there was a discussion within the Godhead. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And the plural, the pronouns used here is kind of important, where it says, let us and our image. And so what it's telling us is that this act of creation set human beings apart from all of the rest. What God was about to do must have just blown away the angels. As they're watching all this unfold, they can't hardly believe it. Look at that. As he consent, continues to, to, within the counsel of God, talk about this. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Because each person of the Trinity had a part to play in the creation. Uh, the Father commanded. The Son created. Now it comes to all of life, and especially human beings, it was the Holy Spirit that breathed life into the nostrils of the first human, Adam, in Genesis 2-7, which directly relates in just a sidebar to, to John 3, in that conversation with Nicodemus, when it talks about the role of the Holy Spirit. And when one is born again, when one is born again spiritually, it's the Holy Spirit that breathes into the nostrils, if you will, of, of those who are born again and breathes life into their dead spirit. So they become, you know, alive spiritually. It's the Spirit of God who does that. So you are someone and not something. You're con con directly created by God. So that when one is conceived, it's... It's God who gives them animation and life. It's God who is the one who, um, who knits them together. That's how the psalmist says it in Psalm 139. You knit me together in my mother's womb. 
Nancy Piercy is a, is a writer I really love. And she wrote a book called um, Finding Truth, which has been very helpful to me personally. And she writes that um, when, when human beings turn away from the living and true God and they follow man-made idols, follow me here, when we turn away from God and we turn to man-made idols, we reduce ourselves to the level of that God that we have created and that we value in our imagination, in our mind. We created that thing. And everything is devalued to the level of that, even the way we look at ourselves and the way we look at others. So that we lower people. We lower people to less than being fully human in the way that God has created us and that we are no longer crowned with glory and honor because we are inferior. Any idol is always inferior to the living and true God. Always. And so when you think that way, everything else is reduced. And so human beings become something because the God that they worship is something. And, and, and so when we view others as something, bad things can happen. Not only to ourselves and what we do to ourselves, but the way we think of others and the way we devalue and use and sometimes abuse people. Uh, the high view that we should have of ourselves is in Genesis 1, 26 and 27 there. The high view of, of, what, of, of the way God has created us. So that it says here that the personal God deliberated, thought about this. Not weighed, am I or am I not going to make human beings, but rather there's a deliberation because of the, how special we are, that we're set apart from every other creature that had been created. So there was a conscious intent, let us make man in our image. So we are not the result of some random, impersonal, accidental collision of circumstances, but that we are created by personal deliberation by God in the counsel of his will and for his good pleasure. He has done this. Now, any culture or any ideology that removes God or puts in a substitute has proven in history how disposable and inferior human beings become. Look at Karl Marx and his philosophy that was applied to the max by Stalin, who deliberately, deliberately murdered six million people. And then collateral damage goes up to like nine million people. That's because of his worldview. The Holocaust is a worldview consequence. Look how disposable people, human beings became as a result of the, the way people thought. The killing fields of the Khmer Rouge in Cambodia, where 1.3 million people died. That's a result of, of the God that they served and that they constructed in their own mind that made human beings just like, well, let's just get rid of them. They're in the way. We don't want them around. You start with Cain killing his brother, and you go right up to modern times. And, and this deliberate removal of the true God from the discussion within even our own nation is a slippery slope. When people tell us and they say, you know, you need to keep your Bible out of this discussion. Are you kidding me? That's exactly where it belongs. Because the slippery slope is going to take us in a direction we don't want to go. We have to consult the Lord on this. So, for example, do you value and uh, do you um, live for financial success? W whatever it is that you love is the big goal of your life. That can become an idol. 
An idol is anything that you want more of than God. Something you strive for more than him that you rely on for fulfillment. That is an idol. And so when one says, well, my goal, my big goal in life is to become financially successful and to enjoy all of the rewards of financial success, then people become objects that we use in order to attain that. Have you been victimized by somebody who has this ambitious greed? And you still remember today how, how you felt so used by them. You, you were like a rung on a ladder that they stepped on to get higher. And it almost makes you sick to your stomach because you're thinking about how you were just you know, disposable. Because after they, you were no longer useful, they get rid of you. You know, like you were invisible. You know, Piercy makes the observation, she says that no matter what your idol is, you feel pressure to measure every part of life by that yardstick. And this touches on how people view people. And that's why people become some things rather than some bodies. We devalue what God has created with glory and crowned with glory and honor because it comes back to idolatry. Here's the proper view. Here's the proper view, Psalm 73, 25. Whom have I in heaven but you, Lord? I desire you more than anything on earth. You know, the person who wrote that, wanted God more than financial success. The person who wrote that wanted God more than physical attraction or physical beauty. They wanted God more than professional accomplishments or earthly pleasures or public recognition or power or control or to be in the driver's seat. They wanted God. And they wanted him more than anything else. So let's lift up our eyes and let's discern what we see when God created human beings, how much he loves us and how much he values us and has made us into the objects of his great pleasure. Perhaps you're guilty today of devaluing somebody through your words or through your actions or an attitude of your heart. We call that utilitarianism, where people just become objects as long as they're useful, as long as we can utilize them. But when they can no longer fill that role, we just kind of walk away from that relationship. When we substitute the true God for something inferior, we lower not only ourselves, but we lower other people. And it becomes more in the level of that God that we had constructed in our minds. So we go back to Genesis 1.26, and it informs us that you are someone. Why? Because the living and the true God created you for his pleasure. And he deliberated over it. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. Well, there's another reason why you are someone and not something, and that is because you've been made in the image of God. Verse 27, so God created man in his own image. He created him in the image of God. He created them male and female. What word is mentioned three times? Created. It emphasizes here that God himself was the one who directly created humans. There was no one prior to, to Adam. Adam was not born from Stone Age parents. There was nobody until God created him, as we find out from the dust of the, of the ground. But he created Adam. And Adam was a real historical person. Jesus believed that Adam was historical. So in, um, in Matthew 19, he uses uh, chapter 2 and, and the personal and the historical Adam as undergirding his, his view on marriage and the value of, 
of marriage. The Apostle Paul in Romans 5 identifies a historical Adam. Luke 4 puts Adam in the lineage, traces it all the way back to these real people who really lived all the way back to Adam. Adam is not a myth. He's not just something, well, there is this, you know, this trend today that assaults the trustworthiness of Scripture, the reliability. People begin to doubt and say, really, can I believe this? Because there are people who profess to be Christians who are actually asking the question, is this really real? I mean, was there his, a historical um, Adam? And they begin to doubt that. And as a result of that, it calls into question the entire storyline of the Bible that is at its apex with the crucifixion of Jesus. It takes us all the way to the cross. So when you begin to undermine all of this, you begin to cast doubt upon what really happened there. Is it exactly what Paul talks about in, in Romans 5? Three times in verse 27, God created Adam and Eve, as we find out later in chapter 2. And, um, and he doesn't want us to miss this. Distinctly created, male and female, and created with purpose. So what does it mean to be created in the image of God? Well, when you look into a mirror, you see a reflection. Now, that reflection is not you. I mean, right? It's just a reflection of you. But, but it, is, it is nevertheless an accurate reflection. And we are an accurate reflection of something of God, but we are not little gods ourselves. But when we look at the reflection of God in us, we see a genuine copy that is created for the purpose of engaging with God and communing with Him and fellowshipping with Him and enjoying God and, and uh, to have that capacity to really know our Creator in a personal, wonderful, close friendship. And the no creature is, other creatures are, are, that He created are able to do it like us. Even the angels can't do it quite like us in the wonderful way and the capacity that we have. So we're uniquely able to enjoy Him. We can speak to Him. We, we reflect him in um, moral righteousness, in holiness, in the way that we live, the choices that we are able to make. Uh, we're able to create. We're able to enjoy beauty and to reflect upon it and to look at it and say, isn't that beautiful? Well, God gave us that capacity to be able to do that. To have dominion over the works of his hands is an act of worship, and we do it as unto the Lord. Now, sin... Granted, it has marred our capacity to faithfully reflect the character of God. But when we're born again, born of the Spirit, He literally comes to dwell within us, and we're called temples of God. And God gives us this wonderful capacity to, uh, to resume and to uh, he remakes us and continues to sanctify us so that we're able to really be at the maximum of being a, a human being and ultimately when we see Jesus face to face. You know, 2 Corinthians 4.16, even though our outer person is being destroyed, our inner person is being renewed day by day. We reach that maximum of what God has intended for us to be fully human. Isn't that a great idea? A complete body, soul, and spirit. One day we'll have a brand new body and have peace with God and to enjoy Him. Now, the animal kingdom can't experience that. It's unique to human beings, and it's unique especially to Christians who are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. And now, next week, I'll be considering the question about is there meaning and purpose to life, which is kind of like the second part of this. This is just part one. So what have we learned here today? Well, one thing that we've learned here is that you're the handiwork of God. You're a, you're a masterpiece. He deliberated over you and crowned you with glory and honor. This isn't to puff us up with some kind of self-pride, self but it's to cause us to reflect 
and to admire what God has done, and it moves us to properly think about ourselves. That our value is not based upon what others say about us. It's not based upon what the society says or how it advertises it. I mean, your value has got nothing to do with whether you have white teeth or not. Got nothing to do with the brand of clothes that you wear. And nothing to do with the title of your job. It's got nothing to do with the kind of things that society values and places a value on a human being. The possessions that somebody owns or the achievements or the, the place, the birthplace in your family. You know, some people really think about themselves. Oh, you know, my sister is more important than I am. No, no, that's not true. That's not true at all. Not true at all. The Bible shifts our thinking away from the way the world thinks and reminds us that God created us with purpose. And so when we view, when we have a high view of God, it results in a high view of ourselves and of other human beings. And we reach the maximum of what it is to be human when we enter into a right relationship with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. And he restores what the fall has destroyed. Uh, the first Adam, you know, Adam of, the, of, the, of history in the, in the Bible, the, his sin alienated us from God. But the second Adam, the Lord Jesus Christ, reconciled us to God. So what was destroyed by the disobedience of the first is being restored by the obedience of the second. Are you a Christian? Are you born again? Do you have the Spirit of God dwelling in you? Is he, has he created you new and continues to manifest and show in you all of the wonderful qualities of the Lord Jesus Christ? So, let's go back to the question I asked at the beginning. What is a human being? A human being is created by God in the image of God to know God and to enjoy God. That's what we are. Let's pray. Our Lord and uh, our God above, as you have created us for a, and designed us for a great purpose, we pray First and foremost, we would uh, applaud you and thank you for what you have done to recognize the value that you placed in us. You have ordained that and declared that. It's not something we came up with. And so we pray that we would not only think of ourselves properly, but we would treat and think of others around us in the way that would honor you. We pray that also that as we think about our place in this world, that, that we would do so always with this particular view of reality, that human beings have been created by you. And it touches on so many of the issues that are pressing against us today. Help us to be able to enter into discussions in such a way as to insert the truth from your word. Now, to that end, we pray for the help of the Holy Spirit as he sanctifies us and enables us to look more and more like the Savior who bought us with his own blood. And we pray that you would manifest yourself through us. In Jesus' name, amen.